Hello, this is Andy Gaze, and it's December the 28th, uh, 2021. Uh, I hope you had a nice holiday, and I wanted to also wish you a happy 2022. Uh, unfortunately, we're having the explosion of the Omicron curve, so this is going to be the update we do this uh, this month. So let's kind of go through it. So uh, on the good side, Pfizer has been approved by the FDA for a new pill that is 89% effective that can be taken orally within the first five days after you have symptoms. Uh, the other potential good news is Omicron seems to be less severe and could, could be looking more like cold symptoms, but we don't have a lot of data yet on unvaccinated patients there and the long-term consequences. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on do you have the right mask and the right fitting against uh, Omicron, which is so infectious, so you don't want to miss that. And also there's some good news that uh, there is some universal vaccine in development that could work with all the different variants. On the bad news, uh, European Omicron uh, is being uh, devastating to Europe there, and the restriction in some countries seems to be working. Uh, unfortunately, Merck had had a drop in the effectiveness of its oral pill. Uh, the bad news in the U.S. is 65% of our Americans are at risk of Omicron because it seems that only the booster provides adequate infection protection. And the CDC is just uh, dropping the quarantine from 10 to 5 days, but there is some debate about how much data they have to really validate this in the middle of an Omicron surge. We'll talk about this. And on the ugly side, unfortunately, Omicron, uh, as we predicted a month ago, is exploding across the world and the U.S. We'll share the data. Uh, it looks that the new the booster vaccine is protective, but only the booster. And we have data, again, across all the vaccines. Hospitalization is back up. Uh, 2021 COVID death rate now has passed 2020. And there's a very worrisome uh, study that just came out uh, when they did an autopsy on 44 people there that showed that Omicron, uh, sorry, that the COVID is spreading across the whole body and all the tissue there. And that's a big worry with Omicron, uh, is that what's the long-term risk of Omicron? So let's go through it. Uh, uh, as you can see in that red color, in that deep, deep red there, uh, Omicron is now uh, over 20% of the worldwide cases. Uh, and let's take a look at the difference. Delta is on the left, and it was a very aggressive variant. Uh, Omicron seems to be more infectious than Delta. It's clearly showing all the behavior of that. The number varies depending on the study between 3x more uh, uh, infectious versus 6x. Uh, it has over, Omicron has over 50 mutation. And uh, let's take a look at a little bit what they are. Uh, it's really a monster uh, uh, variance because it's combining mutation that we have seen in other variants in the past. Sorry, my slides are going crazy. Uh, and so here we are. So it's combining a variance um, uh, of mutations that we've seen in the past. And it has its own set of unique mutation there. So for people who are seriously uh, interested there, these are all the details. Uh, on the mutation there that's combining from other, other type of variants. And these are the ones that are unique that we have never seen before, and we still try to learn what it is. And that is a long list. Um, it came from South Africa, and in South Africa, it pretty much took over the country in a very short period of time between November and December there. You can see it took over the whole place. And why is that? Honestly, um, we've now seen several dangerous variants coming from South Africa. The reason is that uh, in the southern part of the African continent, there there are 20 million people living with HIV, and 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 then you have a lot of people that also have tuberculosis, and as a result of that, they're immunocompromised. That means the virus is able to to stay in the, in the patient's host and mutate over a long period of time and then, of course, escape and spread. And so we should expect more mutation coming from that part of the African continent, unfortunately. So uh, what are the symptoms of Omicron? Again, we're literally uh, 
you know, learning as we go here. And, and what's interesting, it looks more like a common cold. It's very different than the first Wuhan variant. In the Wuhan variant, we were talking about fever, cough, and loss of sense and smell were the most interesting part. And if you see here in the red zone, the reduced smell uh, was only 12% of the patient in the study there. And, and the fever was only 54%. So really, since we have the common cold that's gonna be hitting at the same time as Omicron, uh, you need to really get yourself tested there because the first symptom looks like a common cold, a cough, a runny nose, fatigue, sore throat, and headaches. So don't be fooled. Uh, you need to make sure that you test yourself. So uh, the good news is the data so far uh, has come from multiple studies show that it could be 50 to 70% less severe. And it clearly shows a lower amount of viral load inside the lung. There's a higher amount of viral load in the nose, which is why it's so infectious. But it seems to have lower um, uh, infectivity uh, inside the cell. And that seems to be not confirmed in the last couple of weeks by several studies. Uh, Israel, uh, which is one of the best uh, country there for data, is clearly seeing an increase in the number of infections, despite the fact they have a very high vaccination rate. But the good news is that they also confirmed the lower hospitalization rate based on the amount of infection. And this is despite the fact that they've been extremely aggressive in, in, in the vaccination rate, but also the boosters. They have one of the highest percent of the population has the booster. You can see that in, in the green area, the dark green there. And, uh, and so, so that's a lesson to be learned that we're going to talk more about it, which is that you need that booster uh, in, inside the U.S. as fast as possible. So booster is the best Omicron defense. If you haven't been boosted, you have to get yourself ASAP. Uh, we can see in the yellow zone, in the yellow line, Moderna, which the effectiveness against infection has dropped from 90% to 70%. But as soon as you get uh, with time, with after six months, and as soon as you get the booster, it's equivalent to the data we've seen from Pfizer, which goes back to 93 to 95%. AstraZeneca, we know, was less effective to start with and it was dropping to as low as 44% after six months and then also gets back up after the booster. So uh, uh, this is the thing that we worry. Uh, the data I just showed was with, with Delta. Now with Omicron, you can see a massive drop for people who only have the two doses. Uh, and Moderna, which is in red, a 33x drop in protection against infection. Pfizer is 44x. And remember, the scale on the left side is exponential, is logarithmic. Uh, AstraZeneca, you can see, drop even more. Uh, and then pretty much Russia and China uh, don't have protection. And J&J, unfortunately, has very little protection if you only had two doses. So if you had the two doses of J&J, you need to get an mRNA uh, booster as soon as possible. So uh, another interesting study just came out showing what happens if you have the two-dose vaccination. You can see that big drop. Uh, um, that's happening with two doses. But on the other hand, if you do get the booster, you can see that it is going back up significantly uh, in the protection. It's not full protection there. Uh, this is uh, showing the amount of uh, NT, you know, after the exposes to the Omicron. So uh, lessons learned, get boosted. Uh, the data so far, it seems to be indicated between three to six X more infectious there. And one of the interesting study came out of Hong Kong showed that there's 70 times more viral load in the airways, so, uh, in the nasal cavity uh, that you have from Delta. That's why it spread so easily. Um, uh, it's, it's basically uh, across people who have been previously vaccinated or infected. So the, the antibody you had from a prior infection of COVID doesn't protect you against Omicron. Um, the good news is that the data is coming up, as I mentioned earlier, from South Africa. It's 70 to 80 percent lower hospitalization. Scotland was 66 uh, percent. It does seem to decrease by a factor of 10x the amount of viral load in the lungs, i.e. that what gets into the body. Uh, the bad news, that a lot of the breakthrough cases is correlated with age, and we have some data uh, that I'm going to go over a little bit later on. It's mostly the population over the age of 65 who are at risk. So why is it a worry? If we're having a very infectious disease uh, like the Omicron, what happens is that it is very high percent of the population that is going to get infected because it is pretty much everywhere and it's so easy to get. And even if we have a lower percent of people end up in the hospital, because the amount of people 
who are getting the infection is so high. I mean, it just got reported there were 500,000 cases yesterday in the U.S. Part of that may be due to the Christmas holiday data reporting. Uh, uh, but if you basically multiply this by uh, a lower percent of hospitalization, it is a very big number still that could overwhelm the hospital system. So what's happening in Europe, which is always uh, an indication of what happens in the U.S., and you can see that it's an explosion. It's an explosion that's significantly higher than what we saw in the summer when we had that Delta wave. I mean, look at Denmark. It is at the rate per million, so it's normalized by the population there, that is uh, you know, significantly higher, up to 4x uh, the rate of the US, France and the UK. So we should expect that we are typically once month behind Europe. We're going to get a massive wave that is going to hit the US uh, in January. Uh, it is pretty clear cut. It's coming at us with full force. Um, now, in Europe, they were uh, forcing restriction in several countries. And when you do the restriction, which in the Netherlands was shelter in place, it was a full shelter, shelter in place. In Belgium, people were supposed to work at home four days out of five, and they were restricted on how many people could come in their house. Germany had a different level of, of, of restriction, especially for the unvaccinated. And Austria, as you know, had also a lockdown. It did work. Of course, it was extremely difficult during the holiday period. Uh, it is something that we will not do in the U.S., so we're going to have to look at other means to control the Omicron. A uh, very interesting study came out from The Economist showing that initially we were looking at protection from people who had had antibodies by, uh, by having been infected or were vaccinated with the two dose. And you can see that was the bottom axis there in the U.S. was doing great. Unfortunately, Omicron is creating a new axis, which means only people really have the booster vaccination really have significant protect, uh, protection there. And then you have countries like Chile and Brazil and UK and, and Israel and Britain who have been extremely aggressive in pushing this COVID, this COVID booster. Uh, uh, and uh, they have even decreased the time from six months to as low as three to four months, depending on the country. And we're going to talk about that. So who is at risk of a breakthrough case? There's a fantastic study from Kaiser. Uh, using the EPIC data, which is a, a company there that managed most of the medical record in large, large hospitals in this country there. So it was looking at 120,000 people hospitalized in 250 hospitals across all the states. So it's a very, very good sample of the population there. It was done before Omicron, so, so you know this is really during the Delta phase. But what they show is 69% of breakthrough cases. And breakthrough is defined when you had the two doses and you still end up with an infection. And, and in this case, they got the people who got hospitalized, 69% of them were people of the age of 65. The good news is their length of stays was lower and they had less complication that people were unvaccinated. So there's no doubt that despite the fact you get a breakthrough case, the T cells is still helping you protect yourself against the severity. It was linked to hypertension, diabetes, and comorbidities there. And that's just because with aging, our immune system declines and doesn't kick in as as uh, as well as for the younger population. You can see in this graphic there that in a fully vaccinated, that 69% of the breakthrough cases were people over the age of 65. Where in an unvaccinated or an only one dose, you can see it spread out across, across the age groups. Uh, comorbidity, we've known that from uh, the early case of the Wuhan cases, that the COPD and heart failures, obesity, hypertension is a big factor. And, and diabetes. So it, and unfortunately, that covers roughly over 50% of Americans if at least one of these comorbidity. So the CDC today has revised the percentage of Omicron that they reported for the prior week that they initially, you may have seen the press, was 72% and now dropped it to around 26%. But as of this week, uh, we are at 58%, and you can see it is pretty exponential. So I will say by January, it should be the dominant uh, variant in the U.S. And, and so that is the one that is so contagious, and you need to start thinking differently in how to protect yourself. Uh, the CDC has even mentioned today that being outdoors may not be as safe as it used to be with the other variants there. So we're going to talk about the fact you need to change your mask strategy and how you fit your mask. 
Today, uh, it was reported that on December the 27th, 500,000 cases were reported. Now, part of that is probably a skew due to a delay of some of the reporting during the Christmas holiday. But you can see that we are going to break the records. And, and if you look just at the averaging, which is over seven days, we are 243,000 days. We are going to pass uh, the spike that we had during last winter. We are going to break new records. Uh, we pretty much have uh, doubled uh, the number of cases in the last two weeks. Uh, uh, hospitalization is starting to kick in. You know, remember, there's a four to five weeks delay from the increases in case and hospitalization and another four weeks after that uh, on the mortality rate. So uh, you should expect these numbers to start going back up. Even if it's less severe, you still have such a high amount of, con of infected cases. The good news, you can see a lot of people in the yellow line are getting boosted. And that is the thing we need to really uh, for, uh, help people do that. If you know people haven't been boosted and are eligible, really help them get, uh, this is the best protection against Omicron. So uh, Omicron versus Delta uh, in, the, in the purple is the percent of the new cases. And you can see it depends on the region in the US, so clearly, the Texas and South uh, East is a significantly higher percentage of Omicron. And the Northeast Corridor is also pretty high up. New York is taking a hit right now uh, in the Northwest. So I expect over the next four to five weeks, these numbers to all turn purple. So here's the wave. The numbers are staggering. As I mentioned, the US as a country has doubled in the last uh, 14 days. Puerto Rico is having an outbreak. Uh, they are increased by 49x, uh, which are uh, Florida is by 10x, Washington DC by close to 10x. I mean, you know, we, we're just going straight up as an explosive growth there. Uh, and you can see in the dark blue on the graph, I'm sorry, in the dark red on the graphic uh, that it's really linked to some of the cold temperature there, which, you know, it's all coming in January across the country there. So all these numbers will continue to go across the countries. New York City has had an increase of 644% in the last two weeks, and, and this is doing uh, averaging. Uh, and so you can see that we are talking higher numbers than we ever have seen in New York. Now, the good news is less of a percentage going to the hospital there, but you're taking a 3x, 3 to 4x you know, increase in the case versus the peak we had in March 2020. So keep an eye on that. Um, and hospitalization as a result of that has starting to, to cranking, you know, by 55% and the positivity rate, which is a really key number we need to keep track of, has now jumped, you know, from very low numbers to 8%. So uh, that's despite the fact we have this high vaccination area that remember, unless you're boosted, your two dose vaccination is not protecting you enough against Omicron. Uh, somehow my computer is difficult today, apologies. Uh, California, uh, unfortunately, we are doing the same than everybody else. It is going back up. The little drop down is because of the holiday. So that is probably uh, not going to be corrected in the next couple of days. So don't look at that drop there. It is just the holiday and you know, uh, the, the Christmas holiday is there. So it is going straight up and it's across all counties. So we have a problem in California, that only uh, in California and the U.S. that only 32% of the population has the booster, or on 35% of the people over the age of 18 years old uh, have the booster there. And one of the problem is that we're still waiting for the six months after the second dose, which Europe is not doing. And you can see that if people had J and J, most everybody is not getting a J and J booster. They're getting or Moderna, which is uh, uh, in green or the, um, the Pfizer bio and tech, which is in yellow. So unvaccinated are, are very, very high risk. Uh, this is uh, interesting data that the New York Times just published showing the relationship between the mortality rate and the percent of the vaccination there. And you can see that there's clearly a correlation where the unvaccinated population, uh, which is uh, less than 55% of the population there have the highest mortality uh, on, their, and on a normalized basis for the population per 100,000 there. So, um, so if you are in those population there, you need to be even more cautious in your mask and, and your protection. When do you get the booster? Well, this is all over the map. 
Uh, the CDC is stuck at six months after the second dose because they say it's the only data we have. Europe is saying we can't afford another wave. And so they've been dropping steadily their vaccination uh, booster requirement. Uh, the UK now is dropped to three months. Uh, South Korea, three months. Belgium, four months. You can see on the list there, you know, five months. Spain is only immunocompromised. Every country is slightly differently there. Uh, Israel is now starting for the healthcare workers to provide a fourth dose, and the UK and Germany are considering it. For some reason, I don't fully understand, honestly, there, the US, despite the fact we have this huge wave hitting us, is still uh, stuck on the six months there. So uh, we'll see what happens. So what is worrisome is because now the elder population has been vaccinated and has had access to the booster, we see the mortality rate increasing for the younger population. And you can see there is some uh, differences between the white population, the black population, the Asian there. But as a rule of thumb, the under 25 to 45 years old is where we see uh, COVID being uh, one of the leading cause of mortality in that population group, where we seem to have done a good job in protecting the, the people over the age of 65 with the vaccine and the booster campaign. Wearing a mask, it's all over the map in the world in what people are doing. Uh, in the US is in green and you can see we're not really doing that great. We're at maybe at 35, 37% of the population wearing a mask when leaving home. Globally, people are doing a much better job. I think the, if, if you ever travel to Europe, uh, you can see that the high percent of the population is wearing their mask versus, versus the US. So let's talk about the information we have learned. Uh, there's a very uh, excellent article that just got published uh, last week in JAMA, and it shows that the protection, which is the fitted filtration efficiency, FFE, is really all over the map depending what you're wearing. And we're going to look at two sets of masks. The one that's consumer grade, and you can see there's a lot of people that have these two layer nylon mask. And then you have the cotton ban bandana there. And then you have the three layer cotton mask. I'll let you take a look at that. These are all a lot of the masks. All of them are usually uh, holding against the ear. Uh, they're not going behind the back of the head. They're basically holding against the ear. And the efficiency uh, we're going to look is as low as 38%. Uh, you're not protected. If you look at medical mask, there's a lot of different way of doing the fitting. What most people do is that they just put it around their ear, which is number A here. A lot of the professionals, what they do is that they tuck them in, as you can see in picture B, and then they flip it so that you have a bit of an X uh, along the earlobe there, and that basically creates a tighter fit against the face. If you have to wear for a long period of time, some people are using this printed ear guard, so there's not too much stress on the ear and and then you can see some people who are doing some really at risk procedures there uh, they can put a rubber band here to increase the fitness there or they use a nylon hosiery there again to increase the tightness so let's look at the numbers so uh, i've put in red the one i'm really not doing well uh, and so that's a lot of the polypropylene mask with the fixed air loops which a lot of people are using because you know it's so convenient and easy to use you have a 28 percent filtration and protection so not really there uh, the three layer cotton mask with air loops is 26 percent so uh, if you're using some of the surgical mask uh, with the air loops without tucking it it's 38 percent it is a bit better there and then you have the one where you tuck it and you're just basically uh, uh, you, you tie the loops there and that's 60 percent really what you need is an n95 that means that 98% of the particles of less than uh, 0.3 microns are being stopped there. It is very effective there. I think with Omicron, I highly encourage you, get an N95. I was still able to get some on Amazon, and I was able to get the 3M, some of the big American brands, as opposed to anything that comes from China. It's called K95, which the quality is not always reliable. So really look at this slide there. I will post uh, the link uh, on the... the uh, YouTube website for people to spend more time on it. But really, with Omicron, you need to upgrade your protection, your distance between people, indoor versus outdoor, look at ventilation. And honestly, over the next four weeks, I would, dec I would decrease the amount of exposure you have with large groups, avoid indoor restaurants, and anything that can put you at risk. 
testing tips. Um, you know, most people uh, have discovered there's a shortage of testing. The country in the US here has totally screwed this up on a massive scale. This is going to be a different video in the future. Uh, but it means it's really hard to get uh, testing right now. If you get the antigen testing, remember it, it, it has, uh, it's accurate if you turn positive. If you turn positive, you probably got exposed and you have COVID. It's a very low false positive risk. On the other hand, you can have up to 30% of false negative. So if it turns negative, that doesn't mean you are not exposed. It could be the, the viral load is not high enough to be detected by the test. It's not as sensitive as PCR. Uh, and so when in doubt, if you think you've been exposed, you should still quarantine yourself, wait until the next day and test yourself again. You cannot just trust on, you cannot rely on one test. Um, uh, uh, Abbott is behind, uh, they claim to do 100 million uh, testing and PCR tests per month, but they cannot keep up with the demand because now employers, airlines, and then people at home are trying to protect themselves. So. Uh, you know, uh, get some test uh, at home and be ready. Uh, quarantine, the CDC has just updated yesterday their recommendation. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this one. It used to be that if you get exposed, you should quarantine yourself for 10 days. And now they've dropped to five days, but there is some fine print here. The fine print is that the five days is only if you are asymptomatic. Then you can stop the isolation after five days, but you still have to wear a mask for another five days. And the reason why they've done that is because the whole infrastructure is falling apart. Because of the 10 days quarantine, it has put strain uh, on the operations of hospitals, airlines, and other businesses. As you know, there's been over 2,000 flights canceled over the Christmas holiday and due to staff shortage and the crew. Uh, and there's a similar problem coming with the healthcare workers. So uh, it, I think there's a lot of uh, pressure on the CDC to decrease it from 10 days to five days. But we have to remember that uh, a lot of the infection uh, and what we have discovered with Omicron is that Omicron is much more infectious um, uh, than the other one. That means you viral load and when people get exposed is when you are asymptomatic. And it can take up to two, two to three days uh, until you really know that you have been exposed. During that time, everybody around you has probably been exposed uh, uh, from your infection building up. Uh, we also have learned that unvaccinated people can be infected for up to eight days to two days longer than people who are vaccinated. And so this is a study that just came out from the NBA, uh, where they, they managed they manage those, those players uh, from the uh, uh, for last season, and it just got published in the New England Journal of Medicine there that there is breakthrough infection cases, and, and you really have to keep an eye uh, on this, this recommendation for quarantine. So if you are positive, don't assume you can wait five days. This is only if you are asymptomatic and tested uh, in such a way that you don't think you are exposed. So uh, lots of confusion there. Um, uh, Dr. Eric Topol basically tweeted about the fact there was no data to back up this new recommendation. It was all on the pressure about the lack um, of infrastructure staff, you know, to support the economy. So keep an eye on that. You know, be safe. Spend more time if you have the t if you know if you can afford it. So some uh, amazing data just came out, which is not great. Um, what it shows in doing autopsy of 44 patients, where they look at every tissue in the body there, that uh, the virus disseminated across the human body, and in particular the brain, early in the infection, I'm going to show you the heat map, and then it goes pretty much everywhere. It first enters through the lungs, you know, you can see the alveolar damage, which is the little a bubble there that helps the transfer of oxygen and CO2, but it's also in the heart, the kidney, the skeletal muscles, the intestinal tract, the pancreas, the testes, the ovaries, everywhere. Uh, and this is what was news that came out from this data. It can replicate within the tissue for over three months after infection, in certain cases up to 230 days. So this whole concept that we've talked in the back in the past about this viral reservoir that stays inside the body for months afterwards that may be the, one of the reasons why people develop these long COVID symptoms is now basically being proven with this test. And this was even more worrisome because a lot of these patients were asymptomatic or had mild COVID uh, at the time of the infection. So let me show you the data here. In red uh, is the high viral load, in blue is the low viral load, in white is 
nothing being measured. And you can see on the x-axis, this is the number of days from the infection. So the first group there is less than 14 days. The second group is 15 to 30 days. And the last group there is up to 230 days from the time of infection. And it's very clear that very quickly when you get infected there, of course, it enters the respiratory tract, which you see the lungs and the trachea and the bronchus have a very high viral load. But then it also very quickly gets into the heart, which is why we have this myocarditis when people develop some damage of the heart, which they don't know until later on. And then we can see it goes into the lymph nodes and it goes into the small intestine and the salivary gland, which makes sense. It's, 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 it's near the nasal cavity. And then it goes into the thyroid and then it goes into the sciatic nerve and it goes into your eye and pretty high dose because the eye is so close to the nasal cavity there. And then it goes into the central nervous system, which we believe is one of the, uh, the big the driver of this long COVID problem there. What was a big surprise is that this virus continues to, to duplicate and can be present in some patients as long as 230 days. So big worry that I personally have is that with Omicron being everywhere and we're probably all gonna be exposed to it in the next few months, is that is there a risk of developing these long-term problems that we have seen with the other variants? And we don't know. And so don't assume it's just a common cold and you don't have to worry about, you know, you should assume that you may be at risk of developing long COVID because clearly the virus is going to spread across the body. Now, this analysis was done on the Delta patients, but there is no reason why uh, the, you know, the body is not going to get... Um, uh, an invasion by the virus. It may be a lower viral load, but we have to see what happens. So stay tuned on that. This is to give you an idea in green is the SARS-2 and you can see it's like in the brain, in the neurons and uh, you know, and that explains the famous brain fog that you may have heard that people developed uh, with the virus. So the good news is that uh, we have two drugs that have been approved by the FDA right now under emergency use authorization, the one from Pfizer and the one from Merck. I'm going to spend a bit more time on each one of them. Pfizer is the great news. If you have been exposed and if the pill is available, it's in very short supply right now. And you can take the pill within three to five days of diagnosis. So you have to move fast. That's why getting the testing on a PCR is very important. You can take this pill and it decreases by 89% your risk of being hospitalized or having a severe outcome. The way it works is that it basically look at the virus that invades the cell. And in order for the virus to duplicate itself, and this is what it's so good at, is to explode inside the body there, uh, it needs uh, uh, to get the RNA, which is inside the virus, to come out. And then it needs a molecule, which is called a protease. It's an enzyme that's making the cut to, to allow the duplication. What this drug is doing is binding to that protease and basically stopping the duplication process there. So you still get infected, but you stop that explosion of the viral load inside your body. And the data is pretty stunning uh, that uh, it decreased drastically the risk of hospitalization and death for patients who are at risk. And it stopped the virus by blocking the activity of that protease so the body uh, you know, is not exposed to this massive storm of the viral load. But it has limitation. If you have kidney disease, you know, it's, it's a clearance of the drug and that could be an issue. And it has to be given uh, within the five days of symptoms. It got approval uh, on December the 22nd uh, for only high-risk individuals individuals over the age of 12 who had a positive uh, test. Uh, we have, uh, the Biden administration purchased 10 million treatment, but it's going to take, uh, unfortunately, a couple of quarters uh, before it's uh, readily available everywhere in the pharmacies under prescription. Uh, the FDA made it very clear it is not uh, a way to avoid the vaccine. It is a, it's not a substitute for the vaccine. It's something to help you after you've been exposed. Unfortunately, Merck had the reverse news, which is when they got their final data there, their effectiveness dropped from 50% to 30% uh, in lowering the hospital risk. And on top of that, there's a black box warning because there is a concern, it's a different mechanism of action than Pfizer, that in this case, they're using um, 
uh, a drug that modify the genetics of the virus. And so the worry there is that if you change the viral RNA, could you create a more dangerous version of the SARS, like what, this, what did end up in South Africa there? And of course, there's a big warning for anybody who's pregnant or children under the age of 18, because it could impact uh, birth uh, defects that we don't know there. So there's basically a warning against those population there. So first, first, first direct Pfizer. So Moderna is doing some more work. Uh, as you can see that uh, there's two doses. The half dose is the 50 microgram and that increased by 37 folds uh, your, um, your antibodies. Uh, if you are immunocompromised, you can ask for the full dose and that's 83 time increase. One of the things I'm worried is that why isn't the government allowing a full dose uh, with Omicron coming at us? And why and they allowing people to get maybe that booster a little bit earlier? Uh, data from Europe and Israel show that, you know, uh, that is as effective there. So we'll see there. Moderna is developing an Omicron-specific variant vaccine, but the trials are not going to start until 2022. Other good news is that uh, there is this uh, development going on to develop a universal it's called PAN vaccine, i.e. it's something that will work for all the different variants. And, and the idea behind it is to develop a molecule that's like a soccer ball that has different faces, and each face is basically attached to different antibodies of all the different variants and all the ones that could happen in the future. And so the data is coming from World to Read uh, on the East Coast there that they've developed two different approaches using what's called a spike ferritin nanoparticles, and it has 24 different faces, each one carrying different spike protein. They have done it on monkeys and they had some great results with that. And they have also done some human trials and we're still waiting for those results uh, probably coming up you know, in January, February there. And then they have another uh, a molecule that they've worked on, uh, which is working on a different part of the coronavirus spike protein there. So, uh, so think about this, you have all these different faces there that will be attached to different antibodies there. So you have a, uh, we don't have to do all these boosters and, and different type of vaccine, hopefully. Um, and so the, some of the data uh, just got published. It's still under review uh, by the Nature magazine, but you can really see that they try different doses, the five micrograms. This is showing uh, what's the presence of the virus after exposure. And you can see that, you know, that we can really drop drastically uh, the amount of the viral load uh, if you take uh, that's in the bronco alveolar leverage uh, um, fluids that you can collect there in the nasal cavity there. And you can see that this universal vaccine was able to stop it. You get infected, but then you stop the proliferation. That's what we're looking for. So uh, in China, uh, China has still a, a zero COVID tolerance policy. Uh, they've had 810 cases in a region called Xi'an. And you know that's like nothing for us, but in China, that's a very big deal. So they locked down 13 million people. Uh, these people have to stay at home. Everybody had to get tested. The Chinese know how to be efficient. So they did 6 million tests in one day, which is you know something that I wish we could do here. And one of the reasons is that, is that the Winter Olympics is coming up in February. And of course, they want to make sure that there is no breakouts. And uh, to give you a reality check, American is recording on a daily basis more cases than China had had over the whole period of the pandemic. So very different philosophy. One of the problems that China has is that they claim that 80% of their population is fully vaccinated as young as three years old. So much more aggressive than the US. But the data is very clear cut that I showed you earlier that the antibody produced in response to the CoronaVac, which is the, the, the biggest vaccine in China there, do not prevent infection with Omicron after ever either a second dose or a booster. And pretty much they don't have protections against Omicron. That's why they're absolutely shutting down the country. And uh, for the Olympics, the only people who can come are the athletes. So high restrictions for people attending the Olympics. So I want to thank you for listening to the channel. Please help me and give me a thumbs up and post uh, to your network. Please subscribe. Uh, you know, this is a, a work of love here. And um, uh, please stay safe. Uh, for my friends, I want to share with you that unfortunately I'm losing my, my dog um, due to cancer. And I wish you a happy uh, 2022. And stay safe and see you uh, in a month. And if things go really crazy, maybe a little bit earlier.